century ago, these tranquil fields blazed with fire. It was here that a long dead generation clashed in a struggle that pitted neighbor against neighbor, brother against brother. It is here on these battlefields that the ghosts of that generation linger. Along their tree-lined lanes, cloaked in the passage of time, there can be found all the agony, tragedy, and trauma of war. Only by understanding these things can the true commitment of that generation be seen, for it was their beliefs that sustained them through this terrible ordeal. Come with us as we unlock the secrets of these amazing places, for in these battlefields one will not only find the keys to our heritage, will find the very focal point of America's vast strength. From its founding in the flames of the American Revolution more than 80 years before the Civil War, the United States had grown from a small collection of colonies to a strong and prosperous nation bound by a common history and language. Yet even as the country flourished, it began to drift apart. Cultural, geographic, political, and economic differences forged the first cracks in the Union, but slavery would be the ultimate catalyst for the disaster that tore America apart only eight decades after its birth. There have been a lot of attempts over the years to not say that the Civil War was about slavery, that it was about other issues that revolved around other important factors of the day, economically, culturally, and so forth. But the bottom line, I really believe, is it all comes back to slavery. The Southern way of life had long been structured around slavery, the peculiar institution that drove the economy and provided cheap labor for white plantation owners. To remove it would have been ruinous to the region's economy. Naturally, Southern politicians spent the years after the Revolution protecting slavery in their states. In contrast, the Northern states became increasingly industrialized after the Revolution and almost all abolished slavery by the early 1800s. The key issue behind the Civil War has to be slavery. Yes, there are many other issues. There's the fact that we have two completely different cultures. We have a northern industrial culture, a southern agrarian culture. Uh, there is ongoing disagreements on many things. All of these are the kind of things that politicians are able to hammer out or compromise. The issue that keeps coming back that they cannot find a compromise on is the issue of slavery. All the other differences, and they were certainly abundant between North and South, could have been worked out, could have been negotiated. They didn't provoke an emotional response. Slavery did. But it was not the existence of slavery that divided Northern and Southern politicians so much as the question of whether it should be allowed to expand beyond existing boundaries. In 1819, 22 states composed America. 11 were free and 11 were slave states. In the ensuing years, many vicious political battles would rage over the preservation of that balance. As the United States expanded westward, the country's physical growth came to endanger its very existence. With each new state came the threat that the delicate balance of 1819 would be upset. <laughs> 
The Compromise of 1820 really speaks to one of the major defining issues of this whole pre-Civil War era, and that was how slavery was going to fit into the context of westward expansion. As the territories from the Louisiana Purchase were organized, this really came to the forefront of national attention. Were they going to be slave states as they were organized into states, or were they going to be free states? And if they were one or the other, it was going to upset the balance of power in Washington and Congress. So the Missouri Compromise structured a deal so that that delicate balance would be maintained. The basic elements of this deal were Missouri came into the Union as a slave state. To counterbalance that, Maine was admitted as a free state. Anything south of the southern Missouri border would become ultimately slave states, and everything north of that would become ultimately free states. And it was this guiding premise that defined the next 30 years in American politics. Americans hoped that the issue of slavery had finally been put to rest. It was not to be. John Quincy Adams later called the compromise the title page to a great tragic volume. In 1846, the United States provoked a war with Mexico in a bid to extend its territorial possessions in the Southwest and West. Characterized by historian Clement Eaton as an adventure in imperialism of the South in partnership with the restless inhabitants of the West, the Mexican army stood little chance of defeating the invaders. The Mexican army really does a pretty good job of fighting in a stand-up fight. The difficulty is they're almost consistently outmaneuvered by the American forces, especially in Scott's move on the capital. The real impact of the Mexican War in a military sense is that it becomes the training ground for the officers of the United States Army. It's the refining fire that they go through, and it's the first opportunity for many of these men, men like uh, Lee and Grant, who will later lead the armies in the Civil War to actually lead men in combat under fire and experience that for themselves firsthand. When the Mexican War ended in 1848, the United States gained vast territories south of the Mason-Dixon line. The great irony to emerge from the Mexican War was the fact that the American victory almost destroyed the United States as a nation. And once again, the root cause was slavery and how it would fit into the newly conquered territories. So for the two years following the Mexican War, the political tension grew in Washington to the point where disunion and secession was, was a major issue, and it looked like it was going to happen. So at the 11th hour, Henry Clay and Daniel Webster came together, these two great rivals came together and hammered out a compromise solution, which Daniel Webster proposed before the Senate. And his speech is one of the great speeches in American history. And he stood before his countrymen and said, gentlemen of the Senate, I speak to you today, not as a Northern man, not as a Massachusetts man, but as an American. And it was his force of oratory that led to the Compromise of 1850 and averted war for another 11 years. And essentially the Compromise was very simple. Um, it strengthened the Fugitive Slave Act. It allowed California to come into the Union as a free state. And this is the key. It allowed New Mexico and Utah to determine their own fate if they were going to be slave or free. And this laid the seeds for popular sovereignty, which unfortunately, ultimately, would destroy the Union. For a brief time, the fires of sectional strife appeared to have been extinguished, but resentment smoldered beneath the surface. In 1854, it flamed to life once again. Senator Stephen Douglas of Illinois introduced the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which did away with the Missouri Compromise and introduced the concept of popular sovereignty, which would allow the people of the territory to decide the issue themselves. Popular sovereignty, when it was actually executed and implemented in Kansas, became a nightmare that destroyed the Franklin Pierce administration and ultimately destroyed the Buchanan administration. What happened was in 1856, open warfare broke out between the pro-slavery and the anti-slavery factions. 
Lots of people died. Rival competing legislatures were established. And uh, fraudulent votes, all sorts of, uh, of election violations took place. And ultimately what came out of this was a constitution called the Lecompton Constitution that included pro-slavery provisions that was sent to Congress to be ratified. And this happened in 1857, right after Buchanan became president. And he bet the farm on the Lecompton Constitution. He felt that if this thing could be passed, not only would it quell Southern uh, uh, antipathy towards the North, but it would also lead to a stabilization of the situation in Kansas. And Kansas, by this point, had become a bleeding ulcer for the nation. So he wanted to put this to rest, and he bet everything, every ounce of his political energy went into passing the Lecompton Constitution. Well, it turned out to be a disaster. It passed in the Senate. It didn't pass in the House of Representatives, in part because most of the Northern Democrats fled the party and voted with the Republicans. In fact, there was a point where in the Senate, Stephen Douglas was considered to be a candidate for conversion to the Republican Party because of his opposition. In the end, Lecompton got thrown back to, Con to Kansas to be re-voted on and uh, done so with federal supervision. And it was r just absolutely roundly defeated. And thus, Kansas did not actually become a state until 1861. And this betting the farm on this one issue that Buchanan did doomed his administration and in the process wiped out the strength of the northern wing of the Democratic Party and set the stage for the disaster in 1860. The midterm elections in 1858 resulted in almost all of the pro-Lecompton northern Democrats losing their seats in the House and in the Senate. It was a disaster and it destroyed the party structure in the United States and set the stage for the Civil War. In 1856, John C. Fremont became the first Republican candidate for president on a platform denouncing the Kansas-Nebraska Act and the Fugitive Slave Law. Though he was defeated by Democrat James Buchanan, the election clearly demonstrated the sharp political divisions in the country. Northerners voted for Fremont. Southerners voted for Buchanan. By the time the voters went to the polls in 1860, the rift between North and South would prove too wide a gulf for any political party to bridge. During the Republican convention, Fremont and Lincoln were vying for delegates, and eventually Fremont's support began to drain away, and Lincoln picked up his delegates and ultimately won the nomination. Now, when he was nominated, that absolutely petrified the South because of the Lincoln-Douglas debates and Lincoln's uh, approach to slavery in the territories was considered radical in the South. So they were absolutely terrified that if he were elected president, their entire way of life would be destroyed. As a former Illinois congressman, Lincoln proposed that slavery be kept out of the new federal territories and believed it must be tolerated where it already existed. Yet his nomination sent shivers of dread through the South. Their worst fears were realized when the Democratic Party split into two factions, one Northern and one Southern, and each nominated their own presidential candidates. Stephen A. Douglas accepted the nomination of the Northern Democrats, while the Southern Democrats picked John C. Breckinridge as their candidate. The split devastated the party and ensured the Republicans would win the election. Though he garnered just 40% of the popular vote, Lincoln easily outdistanced his Democratic rivals, and in November 1860, he became the 16th President of the United States. Lincoln's election repelled the South and set the stage for rebellion. On December 20th, 1860, South Carolina seceded from the Union. Mississippi joined South Carolina on January 9th, with Florida and Alabama following a few days later. By early February, Louisiana and Texas had also seceded. Together, these breakaway states formed their own government, meeting in Montgomery, Alabama, where they proclaimed the new Confederate States of America. 
If you look at the Confederate Constitution, which was modeled on the United States Constitution, they had a very short time to come up with their government, and so they adopted most of the same things as was already in place in the North. There were only a few things that were different. One, the president could serve for six years instead of four, and states did have the right to secede from the National Union, although they then didn't like it when West Virginia seceded from Virginia. That got into another whole ball of uh, wax. But basically it was that they had the right to own African Americans. That was the bottom line, and that's what they were separating for. I mean, I can't imagine anyone wanted to die just because their president could serve six years instead of four, or that you could secede, no matter how important that was, the way of life, the culture, everything was based upon the slavery issue. Even people who didn't own slaves often aspired to because it was a sign of wealth. It was property just like anything else. So even a poor dirt farmer thought about one day being able to own slaves in the South where he could do that. And they felt their way of life was under attack and they resented the North and a lot of other factors come in. But basically it all boils down to slavery being the primary concern and cause. Jefferson Davis was elected president and quickly issued a call for 100,000 volunteers to serve in the new Confederate Army. Federal arsenals in the new Confederacy were soon raided. One by one, nearly every fort was taken or surrendered to the new southern nation. Only a few garrisons stubbornly resisted, including the man at Fort Sumter, a fortress that guarded Charleston Harbor. Commanded by Major Robert Anderson, a Southerner who remained loyal to the Union, the Federal stronghold stood as an insult to the Confederacy, which meant to obtain it by negotiation or force. Early in 1861, the Federal government dispatches a supply ship, the Star of the West, to Fort Sumner to bring in supplies and reinforcements that are needed by the garrison there. Now, the Confederate forces who are surrounding Fort Sumner fire on the Star of the West and turn it back. And at this point, with that failure of that resupply mission, Fort Sumner becomes the focal point of all Americans as they hold their breath about whether or not there'll be actual conflict. In spite of the failure of the Star of the West, the federal government resolved to maintain its garrison at Fort Sumter. Calls to surrender were stubbornly refused, and by mid-April, the situation had reached the breaking point. The Confederates got into a very bad confrontational situation there, and although there were clear-headed people saying, you know, we really shouldn't fire on the federal government because it will put us in the wrong. Despite the fact there were cooler heads, there are a lot of people pushing to have the final match, the final explosion that would finally plunge the country into war because so many people seemed to want it. On April 12, 1861, Confederate General Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard ordered his guns to open fire on Fort Sumter's garrison. With that first cannonade, the flames of war quickly spread to consume all of America. The South attacked the North, and the perception in the North was that this put the South in the wrong. They had their rights, yes. They had rights to own slaves. They had rights to even argue that they could secede. But they did not have the right to attack, fire upon the national flag. And that really gave Lincoln the kind of boost he needed politically to rally the North and to get people to volunteer to put down the rebellion. The Confederate guns that compelled Fort Sumter into submission served as a clarion call to arms. Across the North and South, thousands of eager young men flocked to the colors, and soon citizen armies sprang up all across the North and South. At the same time, following Lincoln's post-Sumter call for volunteers, several more Southern states seceded from the Union and joined the Confederacy. Border states, caught in the middle of a fracturing nation, were facing severe pressure from both sides. These border states become critical 
uh, in a variety of ways. For instance, you know, the District of Columbia is in Maryland, so there's a big effort to keep Maryland in the federal camp. But probably the most critical of these states is Virginia. So when she joins the Confederacy, taking with her uh, people such as Robert E. Lee and all the industrial capacity of the state, that has an incredible effect on the Confederacy's ability to wage war. In an act of defiance, the Confederate Congress moved from Alabama to Richmond, Virginia, only a few days' march from the Union capital at Washington, D.C. Soon, fresh-faced regiments in a gaudy array of uniforms gathered around both capitals, ready to defend these vital centers. In the spring of 1861, as all these volunteers were flocking to the colors, both the North and the South felt that this was going to be a short war decided by one battle. And it was their own ethnocentric views that the other side was morally bankrupt that led them to this conclusion. Outside Washington, D.C., about 35,000 short-term enlistees had arrived by the end of May. Under the command of General Urban McDowell, this motley collection of militia units with a meager stiffening of about 2,000 army regulars became the backbone of the Union effort in the East. McDowell, a native of Ohio, was a professional soldier who had graduated from West Point in 1838. A solid officer, he realized that his half-trained mob of militia could not be counted on in a stand-up fight. But the Union demanded action. Lincoln himself appealed directly to McDowell, calling on him to move south. A lot of people criticize Abraham Lincoln for pushing the armies before they were ready. But you have to remember that Lincoln is under a tremendous political pressure to do something. He couldn't just sit there and do nothing in the first year of the war after getting all these enthusiastic volunteers into the ranks. He had to at least try something. And he did point out to the generals who were nervous about these untrained green troops that the Confederates were fighting with the same sort of untrained green troops and that they were operating under the same difficulties. Well. It's more difficult to do an offensive operation than defensive, and the Union did get defeated. But you know, politically, I don't know whether Lincoln was thinking this way, he certainly never admitted it, but the North could afford a defeat, whereas the South had less of a chance to defend Richmond, because the North was not going to lose Washington as a result of the Battle of Manassas, or First Bull Run. But if the Confederates had been thoroughly trashed, there's a chance that uh, their, their newly installed government in Richmond might have fallen, in which case there might have been an early end of the war. So Lincoln was correct. Strategically, he was correct. And more important, politically, he was correct. He had to do something. In June, McDowell bowed to the pressure and began to plan an attack. He was aware that the Confederates had two large forces defending Northern Virginia. About 22,000 men manned the Manassas Line under the command of the hero of Fort Sumter, Major General Beauregard. In the Shenandoah Valley, another force of 12,000 men was deployed around Winchester, led by General Joseph E. Johnston, a capable and quick-minded man who had been the highest-ranking pre-war officer to offer his sword to the Confederacy. McDowell first decided to move his army from Alexandria to establish a base of operations at Centerville. From there, he would make a last-minute assessment of Confederate strength and intentions, then formulate a final attack plan. He intended to drive Beauregard back from his lines of communication, in this case, the railroad junction at Manassas. But to do so, he had to make sure Johnston's men in the valley did not come to Beauregard's aid, in which case he would face an almost equal foe. McDowell knew the Confederate armies had to be kept separated at all costs. To pin Johnston down around Winchester, McDowell relied on the generalship of the aging Robert Patterson, a veteran of both the War of 1812 and the Mexican War, General Patterson gained his command through his political connections in Washington. With 18,000 men under his command, his force was ample to keep Johnston busy in the Shenandoah, 
Yet in the coming days, he would prove incapable of performing his task. On July 16th, the Union armies took to the roads. McDowell moved toward Centerville, while Patterson moved down from Harper's Ferry to Winchester. Patterson soon grew convinced he faced an army of at least 36,000. Not wanting to be swamped by Johnston, he meekly moved back to Harper's Ferry and called for reinforcements. The next day, after Confederate spies reported McDowell's movements, Johnston began sending the bulk of his army via railroad to unite with Beauregard. For the next four days, dozens of trains arrived at Manassas Junction, where eager regiments climbed out, ready to give battle to the oncoming Yankees. This early in the war, neither side has really figured out the potential of rail lines. And partially that's because railroads are new technology, relatively new, and it's never really been utilized in warfare to this point. We'll see both sides in the Civil War are going to move men and material over great distances very rapidly utilizing rail lines. It's probably more important for the Union, which has a centralized uh, system of command and control for the armies and a, a national strategy than it is for the Confederates who never really seemed to capitalize on their uh, potential as a nation because of the issue of states' rights that it is at the very core of the Confederacy. But rail lines are going to become just extremely critical to the way the war is prosecuted. Thanks to the railroad, McDowell would soon face an army almost equal in size to his own. After a brief skirmish on July 18th at Blackburn's Ford, the Union troops paused at Centerville while scouts reconnoitered the Confederate lines. Then on the night of July 20th, McDowell held a council of war with all his generals. Spreading a large map out on the dirt floor of his tent, McDowell sketched his plan. General Daniel Tyler would take three brigades down the Warrington Pike and make a demonstration in front of the stone bridge across Bull Run. This would keep the Confederate left busy while two divisions under Generals Hunter and Heinzelman looped around further to the Confederate left, crossed Bull Run at Sudley Springs, then pushed south into the exposed Confederate left flank. To tie down the main Confederate force, General Israel Richardson would take a brigade and make a faint attack at Blackburn's Ford. If all went according to plan, the Confederates would be pinned in place by Richardson and Tyler, setting the stage for Hunter and Heinzelman to sneak up on their left and deliver the knockout blow. Orders were written, and by 2 a.m. on the morning of the 21st, McDowell's army was once again on the move. Destination? The Manassas Line. On the other side of Bull Run, Beauregard was busy planning his own offensive. He wanted to take the bulk of his force and strike across Bull Run at the Union right flank. But a confused chain of command, conflicting orders, and other problems caused repeated delays until finally Beauregard reluctantly canceled the operation. Meanwhile, after an early morning march through the dark Virginia countryside, General Dan Tyler's three brigades reached the Stone Bridge shortly after 5 a.m. Sporadic rifle and artillery fire soon broke out from either side of the stream. Confederate Colonel Nathan Evans and his brigade of some 1,500 men defended the stone bridge against Tyler's probing attacks. From just after 5 until about 9 a.m., this little private battle raged between the two commands. Tyler refused to press his attack, and Evans surmised that the action taking place at the stone bridge was merely a demonstration. His hunch was soon proven to be correct. Sometime between 9 o'clock and 9.30, while Evans was waiting for Tyler to attack across the stone bridge, he gets 
some semaphore signals coming from a Confederate tower to his rear, warning him of McDowell's flanking maneuver coming down Sudley Springs Road. And that sets the stage for Evans's great moment in the Battle of Manassas. Knowing his command risked being taken in the flank and rear, Evans reacted quickly. Just before 10 a.m., he moved all but four companies away from the Stone Bridge and marched north up the slope of Matthews Hill. Initially, he deployed his command across a road about 400 yards from the Carter House, facing north. He would meet the Union attack face to face and hold as long as he could. A short time later, he realized his troops could not cover the main road from Sudley Springs, so he scooted his line to the left and anchored it on the main road along the slopes of Matthews Hill. Evans had placed his men in an excellent position. His regiments now blocked the road south to the Confederate flank and rear. Any Union force would have to batter its way through his men before they could even get to the Stone Bridge and the Warrington Pike. With artillery supporting his double line of infantry, Evans settled down to absorb the Union attack he knew would come. He did not have long to wait. At Sudley Springs, the 1st Brigade of Hunter's Division crossed at about 9.30 a.m. Commanded by Colonel Ambrose Burnside, the four regiments in the brigade had been marching non-stop for almost seven hours. Exhausted and thirsty, they paused at Sudley Springs to rest. This pause at Sudley Springs really highlights the fact that this is an untrained, essentially undisciplined force of, uh, of militiamen that is approaching this battle. And it's not until Burnside and McDowell show up begin to get people organized and moving that anything begins to happen and so the personal leadership of individual officers is going to be extremely critical this day. At 10.15 Burnside's lead regiments emerged from the trees and walked straight into Evans Brigade. The Confederates opened fire with devastating results. Burnside's men recoiled and soon fell back to the tree line. Minutes later, General Hunter and his staff engineer reached Burnside and ordered him to attack Evans' right flank and push him down off Matthews Hill. That way, Burnside's men could take the stone bridge and link up with Tyler's force on the other side. While Burnside organized the rest of the attack, he sent forward a single regiment, the 2nd Rhode Island, to lay fire down on the Confederate line. Evans' men responded with a series of deadly accurate volleys, followed by a counterattack by a regiment of South Carolinians. Hard pressed, the second Rhode Island fell back. Burnside had intended to launch his main attack with two regiments, the 71st New York Militia and the 2nd New Hampshire Volunteers but both were slow to get to their jump-off positions to the west of the Sudley Road. Seeing the 2nd Rhode Island in trouble, Burnside ordered his reserve regiment, the 1st Rhode Island, forward to the attack. With rifles leveled, the Rhode Islanders went to the rescue of their sister regiment. As the battle was joined, accurate Confederate artillery and musket fire began to shred the Union ranks. Burnside's other two regiments joined the battle a short time later and for almost an hour pounded away at Evans' brigade. Each Union advance was met by blistering counterfire followed by a swift counterattack and twice Burnside's men were pushed back to the tree line. Shortly before noon, the Union ranks were reinforced by a battalion of regular infantry and part of another brigade from Hunter's division. Advancing swiftly, they hit Evans a third time and began driving him off Matthews Hill. If Evans didn't receive help soon, the whole Confederate flank would collapse and the day would belong to McDowell.
As the Union attack started to gain ground, Colonel Evans rode back to Henry House Hill. There, on this grassy knob, stood two fresh brigades sent forward by General Beauregard. While Evans was engaged, Colonel B. and Bartow came up and began discussing the situation with him. And they wanted to stay on Henry House Hill and establish a position up there, but Evans prevailed upon them to come up and assist him on Matthews Hill. And that they did. They swung both of their, uh, their commands over to Evans's right flank and anchored it on Bull Run. B and Bartow's men double-timed up Matthews Hill and formed up on Evans' right. But the Union ranks were swelling fast, and though the fresh Confederate troops took some pressure off Evans, three brigades could not hope to stand for long against two Yankee divisions with more help on the way. Gradually, the Union advantage of numbers began to tell. The Confederates fell back, harassed all the way by accurate long-range artillery fire. The Union troops were now supported by at least 24 guns, which wrought havoc on the exposed Confederates. B, Bartow, and Evans knew that their defense was crumbling. They had successfully held up the Union advance, but the object now was to extract their units safely and hoped that the Confederate High Command had someone else to stop the Yankees. As the Confederate lines struggled to reform, a fresh unit came into view on the crest of Henry Hill. It was the brigade of General Thomas J. Jackson. General B. pointed to the spot and shouted, There stands Jackson like a stone wall. Rally behind the Virginians. Jackson with his troops arrives from Manassas Junction on a battlefield around 11 a.m. and he moves his units into a reserve position below the crest on Henry House Hill. There is some controversy about what General B meant with his comment or even his exact wording whether he was trying to rally his command or in fact go to the aid of Jackson's command. Whichever way it was it's really unimportant because the nickname Stonewall sticks to Jackson from this point on. He's no longer Thomas Jackson. He is Stonewall Jackson. Soon, Jackson and his brigade would find themselves in the eye of the storm as the fighting swept south to Henry House Hill. I think the turning point in the Battle of First Bull Run or First Manassas was when Stonewall Jackson formed up a line of cannon along the Henry Hill. But he formed it up along with his infantry brigade, which was enough to stop the Union and form an anchor upon which Beauregard and Johnston were able to coordinate more Confederate troops rushing up to the area's reinforcements, and it was those reinforcements that were able to deliver the counterstrike that eventually turned the battle into a Confederate victory. By 1 p.m., the Confederate line atop Henry House Hill held nine full regiments and 13 cannon. Beauregard was still outnumbered, but his position on the hill would even the odds. McDowell was determined to sweep through the rebel lines, and he had the forces in hand to do just that. Three relatively fresh brigades, two from Heintzelman's division and one from Tyler's, were ready to attack the hill. The attack began around 2 p.m. and was met by stubborn resistance. batteries of Union artillery were soon brought forward to pound Jackson's left flank with deadly enfilade fire. Unopposed, they set up a gun line about 50 yards from the Henry House, 
To give them support, the New York Fire Zoovs and the First Minnesota Volunteers moved forward, ready to repel any attempt to storm the guns. As these guns are deployed forward, there, there is a problem that develops. In order for them to use their canister rounds, they've deployed them uh, so close to the Confederates that they're within easy range of these rifled muskets that are being used by the Confederate infantry. And so the horses are killed fairly quickly and the guns are stranded. And although the gunners are being killed, the regular artillerymen continue to fire, creating uh, havoc with the Confederates and a situation that has to be addressed by the Confederate command. Jeb Stewart saw the carnage the guns were causing on Henry House Hill. Seizing the moment, he led his cavalry troopers down across the Sudley Road in a wild charge right into the middle of the New York Fire Zoos. With saber, carbine, and pistols, Stewart's men hacked and blasted their way through the New York line and out the other side. While the Zoos were rattled, they didn't rout, as Stewart later claimed. They had killed nine of the troopers along with 18 horses. As Stewart's horsemen slammed into the Union troops protecting Griffin's battery, Jackson's far-left regiment, the 33rd Virginia, spontaneously attacked. Clad in blue uniforms, the Southerners marched slowly forward. The Civil War battlefield is a very confusing, smoke-haze-covered place. And when you throw into that mix the fact that both sides in this battle were wearing very similar uniforms. Uh, some southern units had blue uniforms, some northern units had gray uniforms. Both sides, some of them had red shirts, red pants. Uh, this issue is, is, uh, is a problem, and it creates this confusion whereby this unit is able to approach these guns. In a tragic case of mistaken identity, the Union gunners held their fire, believing these new troops to be friendly. The issue was settled when the Virginians leveled their muskets and fired, killing or wounding dozens of Federals. The Union troops fell back, leaving the guns in the no-man's land between the two forces. The next two hours were spent in numerous charges and countercharges as each side struggled to control the hilltop and its key artillery position. As the Confederates swept forward, a strange, eerie scream accompanied their advance. Soon to be known as the Rebel Yell, the sound struck fear into the hearts of the enemy. Discouraged and exhausted from hours of marching and fighting in the sweltering Virginia heat, the northern soldiers began to fall back, slowly at first, but with increasing panic as men became separated from their companies and officers lost control of their commands. The retreat soon became a rout as many Federals began a headlong scramble down the Warrenton Pike toward Bull Run. Fortunately for the Yankees, several companies of Army regulars maintained their discipline and formed a rear guard that managed to cover the Union retreat. Up from the stone bridge, fleeing Union soldiers soon became entangled with civilians from Washington, D.C., mostly politicians and their families who had come out to picnic and watch the battle. Back on the other side of Bull Run, the rebels were jubilant. 
Jefferson Davis, who had arrived from Richmond, urged a vigorous pursuit, but both Johnston and Beauregard believed such action impossible. In Johnston's words, our army was more disorganized by victory than that of the United States by defeat. For the Union, this first great clash of the Civil War had come within a whisker of victory, only to devolve into an embarrassing defeat, but its repercussions were not strictly negative. It made everyone in the North realize this is not going to be a short war, that they needed as many people as they could get, and another rash of volunteers happened after the defeat that benefited the North. The South, by comparison, ended up getting lulled into the sense of, well, we're invulnerable, we're the best, all we have to do is sit back and let the North come to us because they have to negotiate. Obviously, we've proven that we're superior on the battlefield. The Battle of Manassas was but a prelude to the larger storm ahead. While it had been a Union defeat, the battle hung in the balance until the very last hour and only swung in favor of the South when fresh troops arrived from the valley. Had General Patterson, who was removed from command after the battle, pinned Johnston's army down around Winchester, Bull Run probably would have been a Union victory. Perhaps the most significant aspect of the First Battle of Manassas was the effect it had on both Union and Confederate officers. Manassas, or Bull Run as it was called in the North, made or destroyed dozens of careers. After the battle, both sides took a hard look at the performance of their leaders and did not hesitate to make major changes. While McDowell's performance at Bull Run was really not that bad, he fell victim to the Northern Short War Syndrome and was subsequently relieved of command. And General McClellan took his place as commander of the Army. Besides McDowell, many other commanders at Bull Run had their careers either made or broken as a result of their performance on the battlefield that day. One commander emerged from the fighting at Manassas who would profoundly affect the course of the Civil War, Thomas J. Jackson. His performance during the battle and that of his brigade became the stuff of legend. That day on Henry House Hill, Jackson's brigade played the crucial role in the battle, and they paid the price for it too. They lost about 488 men out of the unit, out of... 1,982 Confederates who were lost during the entire battle. So they really paid the price, but at the same time, no Southern unit played a more crucial role. Jackson later gained command of a corps and served under Robert E. Lee throughout 1862 and 1863, becoming one of the greatest leaders of the Civil War in the process. Besides being a proving ground for officers, Bull Run demonstrated to both sides that much had changed in the years since the Mexican War. The development of the mini ball, which allowed the rapid loading and firing of a weapon in combination with the rifled musket, greatly improved the effectiveness of shoulder weapons. During the Mexican War, troops got within 100 yards of each other and fired weapons that were effective out to about 75 to 100 yards until they could blow a hole into the line on the other side with uh, combined artillery, and then they'd charge through. An offensive line would usually break on a defensive line. Weapon was accurate 75 to 100 meters. The mini ball made the rifle musket accurate out to 500 yards easy, and you could hurt somebody out to 1,000 yards. This now meant that the time that it took to cross the deadly ground jumped from a one minute time frame to five or six minutes. The defense had a whole lot more time to wipe out on offense. The range of artillery, in contrast to the musket, had changed little between the Mexican and Civil Wars. Solid rounds could reach out perhaps a thousand yards and explosive shells around 800. Canister loads were essentially a large shotgun shell good out to about 400 yards, which was well outside the range of a smoothbore musket. 
It was the use of artillery at close range that blew tremendous holes in the enemy lines during the Mexican War, but similar attempts during the Civil War proved disastrous. When they fight the first battle of Manassas at Bull Run, they run the guns up within 400 yards of the enemy, get ready to, to blow a hole in the enemy line and charge forward just like they did. In the meantime, that enemy line stood up with rifled muskets that are now accurate out to 500, 600 yards, and they cut down the entire gun crew. And almost more important are the horses. And now that gun crew has absolutely no way of retrieving its guns. We keep thinking firearms progress, but they don't always progress at an equal pace. A change in tactics was clearly needed but the lack of training and skill among both officers and enlisted men meant it would be years before new methods of attack began to evolve. Although technology is a constant, tactics will evolve very slowly through the Civil War, and part of that problem is the terrible attrition of officers and experienced men uh, as the casualties are suffered by both sides. Uh, in the West, where... Perhaps more of the experienced veterans survive long enough to make some changes. They'll experiment with some rudimentary rushing tactics where part of the unit will fire and, and the rest of the unit will move forward in uh, short rushes, kind of a rudimentary fire and movement system. Uh, while in the East, where perhaps uh, there's a lower percentage of experienced veterans left in the Army, they'll draw back to an earlier era and uh, try some experiments with uh, narrow, compact column attack formations. Although innovations in attack formations showed great promise in controlling smaller units, applying these same tactics to the enormous armies engaged in many battles proved difficult. For this reason, both northern and southern officers continued to adhere to Napoleonic-era formations. The tactics we started the American Civil War with were the same ones that we used in the Mexican War. Everybody lined up shoulder to shoulder, presenting a fantastic target to the newly accurate weapon. The answer, of course, would be change tactics. Well, nobody had gotten that far to figuring out how to change tactics. All they knew to do was speed up the rate of march, get across that ground faster. So instead of going so many feet per minute, we marched faster and moved it up into 100 plus steps per minute. That didn't do the soldiers in the line much good. They could run and they were still going to get shot at and, and hit accurately. An answer might have been to spread out the line, to not present such a huge target. The problem comes with that is that technology had only increased in one area not in several. A commander did not have the capability to control his line spread out over three times the distance or four times the distance. One of the reasons he marched in close columns was so he could yell, just a standard voice over the noise of gunfire and on the battlefield to be heard by his unit. There are no radios. Telegraph doesn't do much good on the, on the battlefield. It doesn't do badly getting information to the battlefield operationally, but it doesn't do much good on the battlefield. How can a commander control his forces if he's spread out? The issue of how to control the immense armies that were thrown into combat during the Civil War was one that largely remained unresolved, even by war's end. We're caught in a dichotomy here. How do we change tactics when we lose command and control just to alleviate a problem that technology has brought into us? because of accuracy. The answer was, build more spirit into the troops, they'll charge into anything, put the officers out front and let them lead it, and we'll manage to muddle through. We had about 10,000 casualties or so during the Mexican War. We ended up with 600,000 dead in the Civil War. That's the difference. Even if tactics had evolved more rapidly, the belief that the war could be ended quickly, widely held in both the North and the South, failed to take into account the sheer size of the opposing forces. In the American Civil War, there is no decisive battle. Decisive in the terminology of an annihilation. We take the army, you defeat it, and 
that's it in this sector, in this, uh, this theater. Part of the reason is, is because the armies are so large that no matter how well you do it surrounding it, you can't surround the whole thing. You can't take its entire supply because supply is coming by railroad. Thanks to the railroads, the American Civil War witnessed a logistical revolution that would have far-reaching consequences. From the home front to the railhead, you have industrial age logistics that really you couldn't improve on very much today. From the railhead to the army, you had the same logistical system as Alexander the Great used, muscle power. And I think that's one of the reasons why Civil War operations, particularly in the Eastern Theater, were so indecisive. That armies were very powerful when they were near their railheads, but as they attempted to leave their railheads, they became reliant upon this huge and very expensive animal supply train and uh, ran out of combat power especially if they were attacking an enemy who was sitting comfortably on his railhead. So I think in that sense, rail, in a negative way, really influenced uh, the manner in which the Civil War was fought. Following Bull Run, the Union Army lapsed into a state of inertia that frustrated and bedeviled Lincoln. It would happen time and time again following nearly every major battle from 1861 through the end of 1863. At only one point in the fall of 1861 did the Union Army in the East launch another offensive. Dubbed Ball's Bluff, it was a small unit affair that probably would have earned only a line or two in history books had it not changed how the federal government prosecuted the war effort. Oregon Senator Baker took a military commission and became an officer in the Union Army and took his small command in the fall of 1861 across the Potomac River where it was summarily wiped out by a Confederate counterattack that pinned them up against the uh, bank of the Potomac River. Well, the result of this massacre and this disaster was immediate and swift and had resounding repercussions throughout the entire war. Congress was unhappy that one of its peers had died in such a grisly fashion, and they became directly involved in how the war was going to be prosecuted. And throughout the rest of the conflict, Congress's intrusions into military policy would color how Lincoln was able to actually carry out his schemes and campaigns. After Ball's Bluff, McClellan and his new Army of the Potomac spent the remainder of the year training. Lincoln waited eagerly for his young general to push south and march on to Richmond, but that would have to wait for the spring of 1862. And then Lincoln's hopes of victory would be ruined by the very man in whom he had placed so much faith. <laughs> 